Reggie here, your friendly neighborhood bodybuilder and comic book collector. And I want to welcome you to another one of my live streams. I am very excited about this live stream for a couple of reasons. Uh, I first became aware of this company several months ago when my wife urged me to get insurance for my comic book collection. And I have to tell you that after I got that insurance, I have never slept so soundly in my life. As you guys know, I picked up a lot of really awesome keys, uh, which many of which are actually hanging on the wall behind me. And it was a worry for me uh, as I had these books in my possession for the, for the first time. And again, when my wife told me to get the insurance, I actually listened to her. I did it and I couldn't have slept more soundly. And so I am pleased to spend a little bit of time talking with you guys about ways to actually protect your comic book collection. And my buddy Bob is here to help me do that. Bob is from Collectibles Insurance Services. Bob, it is good to see you. Thank you for coming to the channel. Absolutely, Reggie. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. I'm Bob Browder. I'm the director of Collectibles Insurance Services. Thank you, Bob. And, and so we uh, had an opportunity to talk before this a couple of times, and I've learned a lot about you and a lot about the services that your company offers. And we are going to spend some time digging into those things over the course of the next 45 minutes to an hour. But before we get to those things, I want to say a quick hello to a couple of people that are here in the room. My buddy Vu Hong is here. Vu, it is good to see you as always. Uh, Jonah is here. Randy is here. Chris Barrett is here. It's good to see you, brother. Wolf Mode 88. Terry is here. Tina Cranson is in the house. Tina, it is always good to see you. Ariel is here and also Eric Press. I want to thank you guys for taking time out of your day to join us. I think that this is going to be a very informative discussion with Bob. And again, I am super excited about this one. I want to give you guys some of the objectives that we've come up for this live stream. We have two of them. One of them is to improve people's awareness and understanding of collectible insurance. And as part of that, we actually want to, where possible, to differentiate collectible insurance from your homeowner's insurance and also from renter's insurance, because I think that there are some differences between those things. And we are definitely going to address those over the course of this discussion with Bob. And as a reminder, if you haven't already subscribed to the channel, I definitely want to encourage you to do so so that you can stay abreast of all the content that we release on a weekly basis. So, Bob, as I alluded to, uh, we had some time to talk uh, earlier today and also previously as we were kind of preparing for this thing. And I understand from you that you are the director of collectibles insurance, that division. Is that correct? That's correct. All right. Yeah, been, Go ahead. Now, yes, that's correct. I've been working in the property casualty uh, insurance business for 10 years, specializing in risks that believe fall outside the box of traditional personalized insurance. So that has led me to taking over uh, the collectibles insurance uh, division of our company. And how long have you been with the company? I'm curious. I've been with this particular company uh, seven years, but uh, a little over 10 years altogether in property casualty insurance. Very good. So you definitely have a background in property insurance and, uh, and also collectibles, having been doing this for the last seven years. But one of the things that I'm curious about is is are you a collector as well? Because I talk to a lot of people in the comic book industry. And one thing that I've kind of noticed for many of them is part of what drove them to do what they're doing in the industry is their passion for collectibles. Oftentimes it's comics. So I'm curious, are you a collector? And if so, of what? Absolutely. So you can't get into this business without collecting something. And passionate collectors understand that. They can have a conversation with another collector, even if they collect something completely different because they understand that passion. They understand the the feeling you have when you get that that rare item um, and it, just something you acquire and are proud of over the time. So I grew up in an aviation family. Um, I was fortunate enough as uh, you know, my father when I was young took me to our local airport, um, took flying lessons, got a pilot's license. From that I was hooked on aviation and uh, began collecting model airplanes, building them, you know, have my favorites. My personal favorite is the DC-3. That's the airplane that actually um, introduced commercial aviation to the world. It, it was also the plane most widely used in World War II, transporting and uh, other military use. So for me, it's, it, it's, it's aviation memorabilia, it's aviation history, and, and, and those related items that really, really are my personal passion.
That is awesome. I did not honestly expect that answer. That is awesome. I actually, uh, my brother-in-law, well, one of my brother-in-laws is actually a pilot. Uh, he's in the reserves and then he also flies for JetBlue. Did you ever fly uh, professionally or was it always more of just a, a hobby? And, and do you still fly? I do still fly. It's definitely more of a hobby. I, um, I teach flying lessons at my local airport uh, part-time, but it's definitely, it's, it's a hobby job, as I like to call it. That is awesome. So uh, was it your grandfather or father that was in the military? And I'm assuming that it was one of the men, but correct me if I'm wrong. W were one of them in the military? Um, no, actually, my, my, my father was an airline pilot. Um, okay. And, and he, what was unusual in his generation was that he wasn't military. And he just he went, to, went to flight school. Um, and, and instructed for a long time, and then 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 worked. They had a long, uh, successful career in the airlines. That is awesome. I was watching some doc documentary the other day, and it was about this guy who, after one of the wars, I, it might have been World War II. I, I could be wrong. He actually, I think, he bought a DC three, mm -hmm. and he put it as the um, the. I guess it was above the pumps at his gas station. And I can't remember what the gas station was called, but it was like an attraction for people in this part of, I think, Texas to come to this place and see a full size plane while they were pumping gas. It was quite incredible. I don't know if you've seen this, but this was, it got me hooked. I actually sat there and watched the whole documentary, you know? I'll have to check that out. No, I, I haven't, I haven't seen that one. Um, but I'll tell you what's interesting about, about uh, gas stations, particularly when it comes to uh, collectors. One of our fastest growing segments is something called a uh, petroliana. Not sure if you've heard of it. No, no, you, you have to repeat that. I didn't get that at all. Sure. It's a uh, petroliana. Okay. <laughs> uh, it's, it's basically collectors of historic gas and petrol memorabilia. So these folks um, basically set up a, a 1950s gas station. They're typically car collectors, but they mm -hmm. want the whole set. So they, they set up a 1950s gas station in their barn. They, they purchase the pumps, they purchase the, the old school signs, and as you can imagine, these things cost a fortune. It's, it's like American Pickers. And, and, and people, people it, it's stuff's large and obviously very expensive, and people have these elaborate setups. As you can imagine, your homeowner's insurance is not going to touch that. And um, <laughs> they, uh, they need a coverage policy for, 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 for automotive, essentially it's automotive gas station history. Could you imagine them calling up Allstate and saying, hey, I have a, a basically a working gas station in my barn. Is that covered on my policy? Yeah. <laughs> I would have loved to hear, hear that conversation. <laughs> that is awesome. I honestly, sometimes when I do these interviews, I never know where the conversation is going to go. Oftentimes it goes to a really awesome place and that that is holding true here. So uh, a couple of more people have joined us here in the uh, in the live chat. Perry Comics is here. New uh, Comic Books NYC is here. Chaotic Kindness is in the house. It is good to see you, brother. Um, we are definitely going to get to some of the questions that you guys are posting up here uh, as we go through the conversation. So uh, I was going I had a couple of follow up questions along those lines, but we went down a, an awesome path that supersedes any of those other questions that I've kind of written down here. So um, let, let's talk. Uh, let's talk about maybe where I just ended and, and, and it ends in a place where I think a lot of people start when they start thinking about collector's insurance because I've actually done a couple of videos on your company before. And one of the questions that I got repeatedly from people when I posted that video up is why doesn't my homeowner's policy or my renter's policy actually cover my collectibles? And I kind of sort of know the answer to that, but with your background, I think it may be extremely helpful for people to kind of hear, uh, is a collectible, is a collection protected through the homeowner's policy or renter's policy? And if not, why not? Can we talk about that? Sure, absolutely. So think of your homeowner's policy in three parts. You have your liability insurance, which is obviously if someone gets hurt on your property and, and sues you, you have that coverage. You have your, your dwelling coverage, um, building damage, uh, water, fire, um, those types of events covered through homeowners. And the third is your personal property. That's the property contained within your home. Um, furniture, clothes, 
um, electronics, things like that. But what people don't realize is even with those items, when property when your homeowner's insurance pays out, those items are going to be depreciated. So if you bought a, a TV five years ago, you know, or, or a computer five years ago, you're going to get a fraction. You're not going to get enough to go out and buy a new electronic device. When it comes to uh, collections, um, the most common one you see is, is things scheduled jewelry. You can schedule personal jewelry on your homeowner's policy. They're not going to allow you to do that unless you submit an appraisal to them. What that guards against is you have this $10,000 piece of jewelry. You send an appraisal for $10,000. You know, as a homeowner, if you have a claim on that item, you will you will get ten thousand dollars. They're not going to go as they would any other piece of property in your home and, and depreciate that value. It's uh, something called agreed value. Um, homeowners companies will do that, but in a very narrow scope. Homeowners insurance is a very out of the box policy. They don't they don't drift too much into gray areas. It, you're either you're either in or you're out. When it comes to uh, rare items, and this started with with things like stamps, art, and coin collectors. When it comes to rare items, you would have people trying to schedule. Um, something unique on their homeowners. Sometimes, up to maybe ten thousand dollars, a homeowner will, a homeowner's uh, policy will allow you to schedule that item, um, if at all. Again, if it's some, they'll only allow you to do it if it's something that can be easily valued and replaced. Um, when you start drifting into things like comics, toys, sports memorabilia, things that you just can't walk to the store and go pick up another one things that aren't easy to depreciate and assess in value, your traditional insurance companies and personal lines are just going to say, we're out. It's, we, we don't understand the value of that. We wouldn't, we we wouldn't want to do the research to understand the value of that. You're going to have to go to the specialty property market to get a market value policy for those because it, they would give you, if anything, a, a, a fraction of what you paid for that. And, and they would give you a fraction because they don't understand it or because they also don't value it in the same way that a collector might. They're looking at it in terms of re replacement value. Is, is, that a, is that a way to kind of break that down? That is, that, that's absolutely a term. I'll, I'll give you an example. Um, say, you, say you bought something years ago for a certain price. 10 years go by, it's worth a lot more. That doesn't matter to them. They're going to say, well, you bought it for this price 10 years ago. It, it, you're either getting that value or a depreciated value. For the, the fact that it may have increased in value doesn't even, is even part of the conversation with them. Got, got it. So, but, so the long and short of it is that a collection may or may not be covered under a homeowner's policy, but it potentially won't be covered at the true value of that collectible or that collection. Is that maybe a fair statement to make? That is a fair statement. And, and the devil's always in the details. If you, yep. if you actually read the homeowner's policy, some, some of the policies will actually specifically state sublimits mm. or policies. They, they'll say, um, you know, uh, personal jewelry, for example, um, $10,000. They'll say other rare items. They may say art in there, $10,000. Um, they'll say antique guns or, or, or gun collections, $2,500. Those, those sublims are clearly spelled out. Obviously, you want to see something in there for comics specifically, but because it's not spelled out in there, you can, you can assume it's, you're not going to be covered, or if you are, you're going to have a very difficult time um, making claim. And that's assuming that the damage happened in your home. Mm -hmm. if, it, if you were, you were sending it somewhere, you were, yeah. you were taking, you were, you were, it was outside your home, um, for it's not even a claim that, that they would entertain. Yep, that, I think that's very helpful. So it, it sounds like one of the best things that someone could do is to pick up the phone. Well, first, look at your policy, whether it be a homeowner's policy or a renter's policy. Look at it, see what the terms are. Personally, I understand very little of that stuff, I'm going to be honest. So I would pick up the phone and I would call and I would start to ask some questions to understand the, the coverage and also the limitations. Does that sound like a, a good place for someone to start to, to try to figure out whether their existing policy will provide some type of protection? A absolutely. Um, you can, you can look at our, our website and see clearly what is covered in our policies. Sometimes digging through your homeowner's policy is, it's not always clear yeah. what's covered and what's not. Those forms are not the easiest to read. There can be what seems like contradictory language within the policy forms themselves. Yep. So it's, it's probably easiest to, to pick up the phone and call someone. They they can walk you through it and just just tell you 
straightforward if, if, if you have an exposure. Yep. And we actually did that. My wife and I, well, let me be honest, my wife did it and there was exposure and that's part of what drove me to actually get my my policy um, from you guys. One of the things that I've heard about, and, and we've we've dug into this a fair bit already, but I want to ask a follow-up question. Uh, a, a lot of people have asked me about these personal property riders. Um, is, is a rider, uh, is that similar to the schedule that you were just talking about? I'm guessing, is it similar terminology to explain the same thing? Yes, it is. A rider and a scheduled item are, are the same thing. That is, as I mentioned, that's most common in the jewelry space. Got it. Um, that is something that is easily appraised. There's typically um, formal documentation if you if you purchase an expensive piece of jewelry, and sometimes that that also applies in the art space. Um, beyond that, though, it's it's there's not much else out there. Okay. So no, you wouldn't see someone calling up their homeowners to schedule a comic book. That would just that would that would be unusual. <laughs> That was a very polite word there, Bob. Very polite word, unusual. <laughs> All right. So is it is it safe? Because we we focus to some degree or another on talking about homeowners uh, insurance. Is it similar to renter's insurance? Would would there be similar limitations and, and, and clauses in that renter's policy? Absolutely. So the difference between renters and homeowners is if you remember, homeowners is essentially liability, dwelling and personal property. Renters is just personal property. Yep. Uh, liability and dwelling would fall under the landlord policy. The landlord, correct. Yep. The landlord policy excludes the personal property, and that's where renter renters comes in. Renters at at a coverage level is the exact same. It, it's it would have the same limitations, and and it's strictly for the for the contents. I'll call it the non valuable contents in your home that are that are, that are common. Very good. Very good. Um, I think I'm familiar with like renters and landlord and some of that other stuff. So, so that, that definitely helps me. And hopefully people in the chat here are following it as well. And certainly guys, uh, for those that are in, in the, uh, the chat here, if you guys do have questions, don't hesitate to ask them. And as best we can, we will try to weave them in. I see here one from Chris Barry. Chris question is a writer is a clause that can be used to nullify the contract if broken. Uh, I'm not going to attempt to answer that, Bob. I will allow you to answer that question there from Chris. Yes. So yes. So that, that is correct. You can also have a rider that, that can, that can further limit your policy. So I, I'll give you an example of a common endorsement that you see typically uh, for people who live in coastal areas. You'll see something on your policy that will say you have a flood loss. Your, your, your personal property is not covered. Um, your, your homes, your home's not covered. So that is, is common, particularly in coastal areas. And again, the devil's in details. It's all understanding your policy. Uh, the collectibles product out of the box does cover the flood exposure. Um, but but even, even our product has limitations when it comes to if you're in a flood zone A, which essentially is anyone in a barrier island or, or low line areas. Um, those exclusions are just, just common. Okay. So hopefully, Chris, that, that answers your question there. That got a little deep for me. <laughs> but hopefully Chris is over there nodding his head and understanding what you're what you're addressing there. Um, before we go too deep, uh, I want to talk a little bit about the two main types of insurance that your company offers. Uh, I, I think that there is one for collectors and one for dealers. But but please correct me if that's inaccurate. And if and if correct, can you add some more texture to that? Absolutely. So collectors are are basically what we've been talking about here. That's going to cover you. That's going to cover you against the most common perils of loss: uh, fire damage, water damage, theft, uh, damage while shipping it, damage while while transporting it somewhere. Um, those those are the most common common exposures for for a collector. We also offer a dealer product, the which covers all those items as well. Particularly, what's most attractive to a dealer is when you, they hear the word shipping. Uh, most collectors aren't doing a lot of shipping; they're maybe receiving items, but they're 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 not doing the outbound shipping. Dealers, oftentimes, that's how they make their business. So there's there's a lot of there's a lot of back and forth. There's also those who are doing the grading; they're doing a lot of receipt of inventory. What's particularly attractive about the dealer policy is it covers inventory that they have in their custody, but may not belong to them. Mm. So they there's a there's a revolving door of inventory. And they know that that 
they can file a claim should they have a loss, even if it doesn't belong to them. That covers them. That also gives their their customers peace of mind that that where the uh, in this case comic book is being sent to for grading. Should a loss happen in that process, um, in either shipment or in the uh, care of the person who's doing the grading, uh, you are still covered. Yep. Because if it is lost. By the if the loss happens while in the dealer custody, it wouldn't be your policy paying out; it would be theirs. And that's all. Okay. I'm sending it out to make sure the dealer that that is taking the item also has coverage. And, and what's fascinating about that is that uh, I think it was two weeks ago we actually had Twin City Comics here on the channel, and they are a facilitator. So they basically receive books for people. They get books signed by artists and entertainers on behalf of other individuals, and they send them off to CGC. And one of the questions that I asked him during the live interview that I had with them was, you know, do you have insurance? And he's like, yes, we absolutely have it. We have two million dollars of insurance. So if books are in our possession, um, those books are safe. And I can tell you there was like a sigh of relief from the chat where people were like oh that gives me a lot of comfort to know that if you have my books my books are safe and i i think that's a wonderful thing i also think about uh cgc because they probably you know, we don't have to talk about that but i'm assuming that they also have very similar insurance because they too have a massive amount of books that are not theirs that are in their possession absolutely yes yeah. cgc um I'm not sure if you're aware, they're part of a, a larger conglomerate that also does coin grading is another mm -hmm. areas, as well as some other areas. So they have an enormous, um, they would have a very large policy covering the whole wide range of inventory that they, that they're taking their custody for, uh, for grading. Yep. And I, and all of that, I think gives people a, a tremendous amount of, um, assurance that everything is okay. So we basically have two main types of insurance we have. Um, and, and just to confirm, um, the collector's insurance also has transit coverage as well, correct? That's correct. And and I asked that because um, there were some words that you used there that could have led people to, to think different. And I, and I have to be honest that, that the transit coverage is personally one of my favorite uh, parts of my, my coverage. And the reason for that is, is I buy a lot of books. I uh, give a lot of books away. And then I also send books off to be graded. Uh, and so... I don't have to pay for extra insurance through FedEx or UPS. Uh, I just do it. I just have the coverage through you guys. And that gives me a certain amount of, of peace of mind. And hopefully everything that I just said there is accurate that I don't have to do that. But please, again, if, if I'm saying anything incorrect, please correct me. Absolutely. No, that's correct. Uh, the transit insurance is one of the most attractive coverages in our policy. And there's different options. And if you're somebody who has a collection that they travel with the full collection frequently, you could have transit coverage up to your full policy limit. There's also, uh, you could also, if that's just not a real world scenario for you, there's also limited transit and that we cover uh, a fraction of your total policy limit, but it's probably all you need if you're only ever uh, traveling with a, with a few items. So yes, those are, those are two of the, the, does that gives people peace of mind? Should I have a theft or damage? While, while taking it to an event, I'm covered. And let's say that I do have a theft of a comic in my possession. I would just end up filing that claim through you guys and not through whoever my home owner's insurance policy is, correct? I mean, it's, it, it would be completely separate and apart from anything that I would do, right? Correct. That's correct. Our policy is a completely standalone policy. So anything is spelled out uh, very clearly on your policy that's with us, what's covered. And anything that anything that happens to that collection that's spelled out on your policy, it's it's a phone call to us. We're familiar with the types of claims, the types of uh, the nature of the products, and and for us, it's, it's business as usual. Yep. And I'm I'm All curious, that. why did you guys get into this type of business? I'm I'm curious, like what was it that motivated? Uh, I think you mentioned to me in the pre-call that the company's been around for like 60 years. What motivated the company to go into collectibles? It was started by a stamp collector, and basically the stamp collector had the same issues. He, he acquired this large, large, large valuable collection of stamps, and his homeowner's policy simply wasn't going to cover it. So he knew he wasn't the only one. Hmm. He, he started a, a stamp product, and it was just a standalone stamp insurance policy. And then as he started talking to more and more stamp collectors, he realized those people also collect coins. They also have art. So the product got broader and broader. And then it just 
as you know, collectors talk to other collectors, uh, sometimes regardless of what they collect, yep. and, and the appetite for the, for the product grew. And the company that I work for now uh, purchased the collectibles insurance um, business back in 2010 um, because it's, 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 it's an excellent product that it has a, a, just a specialty niche market. Yep. So you've mentioned you've mentioned a couple of things already that I want to cover off on. You've mentioned um, that you guys insure stamps and comics. What are some of the other uh, collectibles that you guys insure? Sure. So our biggest growing segments are sports memorabilia, gun collections, toy collections, art, and that's that's the majority of, of what we're receiving today for, for new business. Uh, and the, the Petroliana that I mentioned earlier is also a niche and and Magic the Gathering. I should add that as well. That's yeah, you have, to, you have to throw magic in there. But Petroliana, I, I'm still struggling with that term. And I get the origin of the word. I just I think I, it's the first time I've ever heard that. And I love words. So I'm definitely digging that one. Um, so that's a nice list of things that you guys cover. Um, let's say that I wanted, if I was a comic book collector and I was a toy collector, would I have two separate policies or would that be one combined policy for my two different kinds of collectibles? It would be one policy. The only items that require a separate policy are stamps or guns. Guns have okay. a unique risk associated with them and stamps. It was started as a stamp uh, product originally. And then there was another product created that was more, uh, that was broader and all encompassing. Okay. That's just stamps or guns. Your one product could cover your, your sports collection, comics, as well as toys. And, and someone, uh, it's Lex, is asking a question whether when we use the word toys, are we talking about statues as well? Or are we talking to, what, what are we talking about there? Can we, can we better define the term toy? Sure. It's, it's collectible toys. These aren't toys, obviously, that your kids would be playing with every day. These are things that actually have an intrinsic value so that you, something that you have on a shelf in a case. The first question we always ask uh, applicants, do you use it or do you collect it? This is an everyday item. Um, think maybe sports. If it is, we don't cover sports equipment, but if it's equipment that sign this in display case, yes, it's covered. So it's, it's always, do you, do you use it or collect it? Once you answer that question, if the answer is collect, then, then, then we, we ensure a lot of things that we would never think of, just, just very rare things. But as long as it's collectible, we always take a look at those, those risks. That, I think that's a really great differentiator, right? Because if you use it, then it can't be per se a collectible. Uh, someone else had a, a very good question in here around uh, whether there is a preferred shipper that you guys have. And, and someone cited DHL, FedEx, UPS. Is 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 there a preferred shipper um, from like an insurance standpoint? Yes, FedEx and DHL are the best. I would then say UPS is one one tier down from that, and then another tier down would be USPS. Very so good. Shipping uh, items of value, you you want to do you want to have, have shipping where signatures required. You want to be able to track it and know it got there. And so let me ask you that: is is that required for the transit insurance that we were just talking about a few moments ago? Um, because I've heard to your point about talking to other collectors, that was one thing that I've heard from another collector, but I've never actually called you guys about it. Is a signature required to have the protection of the insurance? To get the most amount of coverage out of your policy, the answer is yes. If if a signature is not required the sublimit comes all the way down to a couple hundred dollars. If oh, the wow. required, it, it will vary by your policy, but it could be up almost to the policy limit. So you definitely, when, when it, this is spelled out in the policy too, if you look at your policy, it will give you a sublimit for, for FedEx and DHL, a sublimit for, for UPS, one for USPS, and one for no signature required. So you know, based on the, the, the shipping, uh, company you're using exactly what your exposure is and coverage is. That is awesome. Maybe I should read that policy. <laughs> That's awesome. I, on, again, I, again, when I ask some of these questions, I never quite know what the answer is. And, and just from about every interview that I do, I almost always learn something and I definitely learn something there because I tend to always ship via FedEx, but I 
have never done the signature required. And it sounds like I definitely need to start doing that to ensure that I get the proper amount of coverage. So you talked um, a little bit about uh, the things that are covered, that are insured by your company. Can you highlight some of the things that are not insured by your company? I'll give you the two most common questions we get. We don't do collector auto and we don't do collector wine. And outside of that, we, we pretty much entertain, entertain entertain anything else that, that might be collected. If it's a, a perishable, which obviously wine is, we are, we are, I don't want to say we'll never do it. We're currently not doing it, but we recognize that's a growing segment and we're looking at different ways that we could potentially do that in the future. Uh, collector auto, there's plenty of companies that already do that. And that just is, is outside our appetite. Very nice. Yeah, I actually, um, I had some collector insur insurance when I had for my car, when I had a 65 Mustang, I actually lost that car. Uh, but that is a story for another day. Um, but yeah, I think, I think helping to people to understand what you cover and what you don't cover and then how the policies are arranged. I think that is all, all very good stuff. Um, let's, let's do this. Um, so let's say that there is somebody in this chat right now that that has come to the determination that they need to get insurance, right? They have made the phone call. They have read their policy on their homeowner's policy and they have determined that they have exposure and they're like, I'm going to give Bob a try. Mm -hmm. Walk us through what that process looks like. Like, how do they engage you guys? How do they get their insurance? Like, walk me through the process. Sure. So the easiest thing to, to do right now is you can take a look at our website. It's, it's collectinsure.com or you can simply Google collectibles insurance. We're, we're the first ones that come up. Or you could even Google comic book insurance. We're also the, also the first ones that, that come up. We, like any other personalized insurance company, you're able to go online and enter a, a couple data points and you'll receive a quote. You'll know at that point exactly is is this worth it or is it not? And also on that website, you'll see the different, basically everything we talked about tonight, everything that's covered, and, and how how we're filling those gaps. Um, if you don't want to call, if you don't want to go on the website, you can also call us. You can also um, reach us on Facebook. We have a team that manages that as well. So it, whether it's um, through online, through Facebook, or through uh, you know calling us, there, there's a couple different ways we can reach out and we can get you a quote and answer any questions you have about the product. Our first question is going to be, what do you collect and tell us about your collection? And then we'll be able to tell you what are what common exposures are and and get you a price for what an annual policy would would cost. And I can tell you that our product is, is very affordable. When you think of the cost of insurance these days, I'll give you some data points here. I have a $15,000 collection is going to cost you $100 a year to insure. $30,000 collection is 200 bucks. And I'll give one more. If you have $100,000 worth of items, it's 500 bucks a year. So we're not talking large numbers when you think about how much people have put out to invest in their collections in the first place. Uh, that those are, those, are, those are annual prices and it, and it provides that peace of mind that they don't have to worry about a, about a gap they have with their insur uh, homeowner's insurance now. And you you used some relatively big numbers there, right? Um, in terms of fifteen k, thirty k, a hundred k. Let's say that that I have, let's say a five thousand dollar collection. Mm -hmm. Is is that worth insuring in your mind? Because that that may be what someone is literally thinking right now as they're watching this thing live or watching it back on on playback. I have a five thousand dollar collection. Is it worth it to me? What would your what would your response to that be? I would say yes, because you are going to, homeowners are simply, it's not going to give you the $5,000 that it's worth. You're going to get, even if you, you recently purchased it, they're not going to understand the value of it. And you're going to get, get a fraction of that very often. Uh, and, and so the person could basically say, look, $5,000 isn't a significant amount of money. It's not worth me even insuring that. And, and so if they make that determination, then they're probably right. But uh, 5,000 is a nice chunk of money and, and people may want to get in the insurance. And if you're talking about a 15K, it's $100 at 5,000, you're not even talking a hundred bucks. You may be talking a significantly less amount of money and that's an annual amount. That is not monthly. Or, or whatever, um, that is for the entire year you actually have that coverage. Are, are all policies annual based? That's correct. All policies are annual based. Uh, the minimum premium for a policy is 50 bucks. 
and that fifty dollars is equivalent to about seven thousand dollars worth of coverage. So under seven thousand dollars, there is no it, it, it doesn't get any less expensive. So one of the other really big questions that that oftentimes comes up is to to the point that we made earlier about schedules, right? Do I have to uh, have a catalog of every single book in my collection in order to obtain insurance? And that just goes back to my previous question about walking us through the process. Do I have to have a catalog of every single book with a value assigned to it in order to get insurance? No, you do not. The only, from our perspective, the only time we require that is on items that are individually valued over $25,000. Mm-hmm. So if you have a couple very expensive items. We do list, we do schedule that off on, on your policy. And th- that just, just helps everyone. We don't require an appraisal on it, but we do need to know that, that you have it. We, so we do recommend though, that although it doesn't need to be provided to us that you maintain inventory. What that helps is say you have a total loss. Um, last year we, we, we were exposed to California wildfires. People had total losses. Well, Having your inventory just makes things infinitely easier when going through the process of trying to 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 remember what you had and identify. Giving a claims department everything they need to quickly move through a claims process, the more documentation, the better. It just makes uh, both parties' lives easier. And then what does documentation look like in your mind? Um, is is that an Excel spreadsheet? Is it uh, an online database? Like what, what does it look like? And again, I kind of know what these answers might be, but I think it really helps clarify for the people that are, that are watching and listening to this. Absolutely. Uh, maintain an Excel spreadsheet uh, just somewhere in the cloud of, of all the valuable items you own. So, so you could walk away from, from your home and, and lose everything that you could easily ex- access what you current, what you plan on claiming insurance for. You turn that over um, in the insurance claim, it then it then makes the process go much smoother. Right. So, so photos aren't necessarily needed. Um, you probably just need a list. That that's kind of what I'm hearing. Yeah. That that's correct. That's okay. correct. We don't. We will ask for photos if in very very high value situations. We will we will take a little more time to underwrite that and make sure that it is indeed something that is owned. But that is that is the exception versus the rule, and we we then maintain those photos in our file. So it should have a loss. It's not on you to 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 send them again. We already we already know that. One one of my buddies asked a question. Um, Undead Mousy, uh, he is actually overseas right now, and I think it's like one o'clock in the morning for him. So he was unable to uh, to to listen. He's going to watch it back on replay. Um, but one of his questions was when he looked into insurance before, he had to have proof of purchase. Is there a requirement that you have to have proof of purchase or anything like that, like a receipt or something in order to have coverage? No, that's that's not required. And and the reason I can tell you it's not required is a lot of times, a lot of valuable collections are often inherited. Those 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 folks obviously want to have those types of records. We, we, we just need clear documentation of what the item is, and that helps us establish value. Obviously, if you have a recent receipt from a recent purchase, that's that's great. We put that in the file, and then then, then there's no no back and forth later. But the vast majority of the time, people don't have records of that detail. Uh, dealer On the dealer side, they might, but often not on the collector side. And we typically just need to know what the item is, and if it's very valuable, we ask, we ask for some some pictures of it, if nothing else. Yep. And I'm getting a, a couple of questions here from uh, Jonah. Uh, I think that's how you pronounce that. And also who that comics, they're asking whether if they, if they catalog their collection in CLZ, which is um, an online app and, and also in key collector app, uh, whether that is sufficient. And the answer probably is yes, because what I'm hearing is that you have, you should have some type of record of your collection somewhere stored, uh, preferably in the cloud. So if you have a total loss of your house or whatever your dwelling that you can actually access that list uh, i'm not sure if you're familiar bob with either one of those apps clz or key collector app but you're certainly welcome to uh, to chime in there yes I, I am familiar with key collector app i'm not familiar with the other one but key collector is, is certainly that's a great tool to be able to nick make my buddy nick i i actually use uh go collect 
that's who I use. And when I did my videos a while ago on you guys also highlighted Go Collect, one thing that I like about them is that they, they primarily are for slab comics. And what I do in their database is take a front and back photo of um, the slab. And I'm also able to plug in some notes. How much did I pay for this thing? When did I acquire it? And so whenever I acquire a slab, I tend to plug that data in right away. And I do the same thing for my raw high value comics. That way I have a database of those things a lot of the stuff that's to my left like some of the you know books from my childhood that are like worthless I, I haven't gotten around to plug those in but a lot of the more valuable stuff gets plugged in as soon as it comes in the house but you 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 hit on a couple of really important things about uh anything valued over twenty five thousand dollars um one of the questions i have to that point is do you have recommendations for how best to value one's collection? You know, because there are people that don't have their entire collections um, uh, inventoried, right? So is there a recommendation for how to determine a value for one's collection or should you just gross up based upon your self-assessment of your collection? So that's a great question. A, a common question we get is, I have valuable items, but I don't know what it's worth. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's, that's that's common. There's certain free tools out there like valuemystuff.com and, and things like that that, depending on obviously what you collect, that can help get you started. The way we do it is we look at different auction houses. Again, depending on the collection, it depends on, on where we where we go. And and for a lot of stuff, particularly comics, there's a lot of there, there is online. There are places where you can get those values. You can also see what they recently went for at auction. Um, there's obviously any other type of online online bidding that you see. It's fairly, with comics particularly, it's a little easier to establish value because there's a lot more of an online trail. It just goes to the nature of, the, of that business. Other other collectible items, that's not always the case, but certainly in, in, in the age of social media, there's usually a digital trail for what things are going for online and we're usually able to establish value because again, our product is a market value policy. So what, what it would cost you to replace that tomorrow that's, that's the amount of money you're going to get for it. It wouldn't matter that you bought it for, for a lower cost 15 years ago. What it, what, what it will cost to, to get that um, comic today is that's the amount you're going to get, assuming obviously it's within your policy limit. So I think I think that's actually a really uh, important point that you just made there. And I think it's an, a key differentiator from uh, how your homeowner's policy would work. Basically, what I heard you just say is that if a if a comic book is insured and covered under one's policy through you guys that that policy is paid out at the current market fmv for that comic regardless of how much someone actually paid for it so literally if you pay 12 cents for that book and that book is now worth and i'm making this up fifty thousand dollars fmv it is getting reimbursed or whatever you are made whole at the fifty thousand not at the 12 cents yes that's correct. Obviously, that's assuming your your policy limit is fifty thousand dollars. Then, yeah. then yes, you you are getting the full the full value of that item. The only time I, I, I if it was a recent transaction, what you paid for it is obviously what you're going to get. But if it, many of these things appreciate in value, you're get, you're getting the current market value. Yep, that makes a whole lot of sense. I actually, uh, and at the, I'm making notes over here for myself as I kind of go through this. And one of the things that I need to do is go back and reevaluate my own limits because I think that I need to increase it based upon my own recent acquisitions. So uh, this is a, a helpful conversation in several different ways. Uh, my buddy Huda at Comics is making a comment here that um, he's saying that something about uh, Key Collector app actually needs to accept the, the, or add the functionality to uh, include photos. I would definitely agree with that and that's part of the reason why i went with go collect because of that photo taking feature um see there's another question in here so what was the amount uh, that you needed for an appraisal uh, there i don't think that there is any appraisal needed i think what he was saying was that if you had an individual comic or whatever collectible above twenty five thousand dollars that they need to have that called out special for the purpose of the policy not to have it appraised uh for for any reason is it bob is that correct that is correct to, to over twenty five thousand dollars we re request that you schedule that item on your policy so we're where you have it an appraisal is, is, is never required. The only time an appraisal would be needed is we do offer something, and this is typically at the higher end collector, we do offer something called an agreed value. Say you happen to have one 
one, one book that's worth fifty thousand dollars, and you've recently had it appraised. You send us that, that appraisal in. Should there be a claim on that? It's never going to be a question. It, it's the, it's we're going to, be to pay out fifty thousand dollars. We're not going to go and, and determine the market value of that policy. That's definitely the exception versus the rule. And typically, when we get into the very high ends, we'll ask if they want to submit an appraisal. It's just an additional peace of mind that should something happen, that there won't be that question. But no, it's not required. Yep. And one of the questions that Joey Solo here has is around um, the termination of grade. And, and that's always a, a very subjective thing, because if I have a comic and I think this is easier if you have slab comics versus raw. But let's say that I have a raw comic and I decided that comic is is a three O something happens to that comic. Um, are you guys going to pay out at the assumed grade of a three O or like, and, and that's the tricky part when it comes to comics is how do you determine the value if the grade isn't understood without photos? That is. That is tricky. We, if obviously if the grade is known, that makes things much easier. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's obviously not always the case. So we're the, the assumption is that it was in the condition was good of the item. So we're, we're going to err on the side that it's in better condition than worse condition. And with, with that, again, what that's going for on the market to, to replace that, not taking into account that it might have been a poor condition item. We just we just wouldn't know that. Yeah. And it could be poor condition and still be valuable, as we all know. So so let's say that someone decides that they are going to get insurance from you guys. They actually go on your website. They plug in their basic information. They realize that the policy that they need is only going to cost them 100 bucks for the year to have peace of mind that their collection is 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 taken care of. How long from the point of um, hitting that submit button and reading that that $50 estimation or $100 estimation before they actually have a policy in hand. What does that timing look like for people? Sure. So if it's a policy that's that's under typically $25,000 in coverage, that can be bound entirely online. You, you can fill out just like any other online application. You're entering account, le account level information, I call it, name, address, answering some some what we call eligibility questions just just general questions uh things like have you had a recent bankruptcy or are you are you a convicted felon things like that Gen comp things that you would be asked in any type of insurance application process yep, yep. have you had a claim in the last five years or three right. years that kind of stuff uh, have you had a claim in the last last five years and what was the nature of that claim and then they'll, we'll ask you a couple uh questions about your collection obviously what do you collect what's the value of it and and how do you store it? Is it all stored in your home? Do you have some mm -hmm. storage facility? Uh, those types of questions. The, the entire application takes takes maybe ten minutes to fill out, and you could then, if 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 you're happy with your price, you can then purchase it right there online, and you get a policy in your email um, after you enter payment information. So all the documents can be signed electronically online. The process is entirely uh, seamless. It's it's straightforward to the user. Policy yep. If you're in the higher values, typically what you're going to see is a message that says your application has been referred to underwriting. What will happen then is a salesperson will reach out to you, just review essentially what you you um, you entered, ask any follow up questions, and then uh, and then approve that. At that point, you get an email and then you can purchase the policy policy online. So right now, I I think that's very helpful, the breakdown that you just gave. But for me, I have and there may be other people here with the same question. So I have a policy now. And like most collectors, my collection is, is constantly growing, right? Sometimes people have collections that expand and contract. Mine just grows. I, got, I lose a book here, but then I gain like eight others, right? So the collection is growing. Um, what is a good approach to take to ensure that my growing collection is always protected and reflected in the policy that I have? You know, uh, does it depend upon the frequency of, of me bringing books in? Like how, how quickly or how often should I evaluate my level of coverage? And then let's say that I assume that I need to increase it. What does that look like? Is it a phone call? Like what happens then? Sure. So the, to increase coverage, and that's one of the most common things we deal with, increased coverage is simply a phone call. You call us. Unfortunately, you can't do that online, but you, you call one of our, our sales reps and they'll, they'll get your coverage increased. You'll then receive an updated policy uh, in your email. Most people we recommend obviously depends on buying frequency. If you recently made a large purchase, you should then look at your look at your policy. For people who do do a couple purchases every few months, 
at least once or twice a year, take a look at your policy, take a look at what you have in inventory and take a look at what your current limit is. Yeah. It doesn't make sense. Again, to increase your limit by a couple thousand dollars is, is small dollars in terms of annual policy premium. So if anything, you should err on the side of, of make sure you have at least, make sure you have a, at least what you need in terms of coverage. And, and even if you need a little more, that then covers you if you're going out to make recent purchases. There's again, a, uh, an extra couple thousand in policy limit is is dollars on your policy. Premium. Yep. So so Chris uh, Bigger has a question here, and and I think I again I know what the answer is going to be here, but Chris is basically saying, what about different grading companies, right? Because the different grading companies will say a book is a nine point eight, but there's there's differences between the grading companies and and what is a true nine point eight versus what might be a nine point four or nine point two or something like that, right? Do you guys make adjustments for the different grading companies, or or do you assume the best that all grading companies are essentially equal and treat them the same we'll take the best grade so if you had it graded by if you had different if you if it was graded by multiple companies we, we will take the highest typically the one we use the most is cgc um but again it's it's i understand what you're saying and it's a difficult question to ask answer because it really is on a case-by-case -case basis yep Yep. Is really at the end of the day, when, when answering claims uh, hypotheticals, it, it really depends on the nature of the item. Obviously, we always we, we always make an effort to pay pay the fair market value on what it would be, assuming it was in 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 good condition. Yep. And Harrison is asking a question here, uh, where he's basically saying, um, I think it was Harrison. Uh, better get to, no, that wasn't Harrison. Um, it was Joey. Joey's solo is asking a question here of um, when. When and if you have to pay out, is the payout based upon when the book was acquired or when the claim was filed? And my guess is that it is the current FMV when and if a claim is filed, correct? That's correct. Yep. It's, uh, it's, it's at the point the claim was filed. Should you have a loss, there's 90 days from discovery of that loss, you have to file the claim. And then at that point, we, we go by the, the claim date. What was the valuation at that point in time? Yep. And I heard from you earlier, this is a follow up question that Joey has, is that I think you use uh, uh, auction houses to mm -hmm. help determine the current FMV uh, for that book. Is that correct? That's correct. OK. And then can you tell us who those auction houses are? Because that's probably going to be a, another question that someone else will ask. If, if you can illuminate that, that would be awesome. Yeah, I unfortunately I don't have those off the, off the top of my head. Um, it, it, they vary by collection type. Yep. And then there's another question here around uh, the renewal of policies. Is it done automatically or do you have to call back and renew? My guess is that it's automatic if your credit card or debit card is still good. Yeah, that's correct. It's automatic. We don't automatically hit your hit your card again, though. You will get a, a renewal offer in the mail that will tell you, here's your policy. Do you want to purchase it again for another term? It's it's, it's not automatic, but the, the receipt of the renewal offer is automatic. You then choose choose whether or not to, to pay it and renew it. There you go. Awesome. Awesome. So there, there's a lot more questions that are kind of flowing in here um, than where we're going to be able to answer in the allotted time that we have, which I think is a really good thing. Um, there were a couple of questions that people are asking that were actually uh, asked and answered earlier in the interview. So I would definitely encourage you guys to go back and revisit some of those, uh, revisit the beginning of the live stream so that you can hear some of those responses. But for the sake of time, I have to continue kind of uh, moving things forward. So, Bob, one of the, the last few questions that I have for you, uh, and you've alluded to this already, but there are questions. People will continue to have questions. Where can people get more information about some of the things that we've only touched upon today? Sure. The, the place I would start is obviously you can go to our website, collect insurance, see what we cover. But what's even more important than that is to look at your homeowner's policy or renter's policy and see what what the devil's in detail see what's spelled out there understand some supplements are going to be clearly laid out there there's also going to be look at the if anything read this section called exclusions that will then lay out very clearly people will find stuff in there unrelated to what we're talking about that they may have had no idea that they weren't covered for in terms of insurance and i think it's just it's just an educational thing it's just becoming more aware of, of where you're exposed and, and where you're covered and then when you identify those exposures you can then determine whether or not it's worth trying to fill in those gaps and obviously, with what we're talking about with, with collectibles, uh, you start with your homeowner's policy and understanding your insurance and then move into filling in those gaps by looking at our product and saying, with this product, I know I won't have to worry about getting a fair market value yeah. for my items. 
Yep. And then where can people go to find more information about your services, your products? Where do they go for that? That's that's this is through our website. It's, it's collectibles insurance services. Just just Google that collectinsure.com. And in there, there'll be there'll be different sections on there. What we cover type of coverages that are offered, what's what's excluded and and who to contact with any questions. Very good. Uh, uh, Lucifer. Our history of our what? company in, in we're owned by a larger group of, of property casualty company that, that has several different brands. And you also get get a sense of, of the different items we insure and how long we've been insuring uh, what we call specialty risk. And the, we, it's just a business niche that we, we have a lot, of, a lot of experience with. Yep. So people can it sounds like people can definitely check the website for additional information. I'm guessing that there's an email address that they can email folks. And then there's probably also a telephone number where you guys can reach out to get some of the additional questions uh, asked and answered. Um, one of the things, Bob, that you mentioned to me uh, previously was that you guys are going to be attending some cons coming up. Uh, what cons are those? And then is it OK if someone that is watching this comes to that con and wants to talk? Is that is that possible? And again, which cons are you guys going to be attending? Sure. So this weekend we're at C2E2. Two of our sales people, two of our sales uh, team members are there. Um, please, if, you, if you're at that event, walk up, introduce yourself. They're happy just to talk to you about your collection, understand how you got into it, and then um, be able to recommend how we can, can fill a gap for, for you and, and certainly answer any questions about the product and get you get you a policy on the spot or get you enough information to go home and, and, and think about it and follow up with you later. We're also attending, uh, we, we attend uh, San Diego Comic Con, we attend New York Comic Con. We attend, um, they're the only cons we, they're only, only uh, comic book focused ones we attend. We do attend National Sports Convention. We do attend things like uh, the World's Fair of Money and different things like that in different uh, niche markets. And we attend uh, the occasional uh, military and antique uh, gun shows as well. The world's fair of money. I have never heard of that before. You were full of surprises today, my friend. That is awesome. So that's for obviously your currency and coin dealers. Very cool. Very cool. All right. So, um, with that, we are going to wrap this thing up again. We try to keep these conversations to about 45 minutes to, to an hour or so. And we are we are swiftly approaching the one hour mark. Again, I would definitely encourage you guys to go back and watch the beginning of the stream and then also to hit the website up, send them some messages, uh, reach out to them via phone and see if you guys can get some, uh, some of the questions that you guys uh, have answered. And again, if you are not yet subscribed to the channel, I definitely want to encourage you guys to subscribe so that you can stay abreast of all the content that comes out from the channel on a weekly basis. Bob, before I let you go, are there any parting comments, thoughts that you have, something that we haven't addressed already? Is there anything that you want to say to the people before we wrap up? Just that, uh, just like every, everyone listening in here, the, the passion of our, our team members, the, many of them are also collectors. We have, depending on the salesperson you speak to, they each have their own story to tell as well. So they're happy just to have a conversation with you about your, your collectible and, 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 tell you how they started and then and then they'll help you fill that gap or at least you know explain to you maybe you know just find the best option for you to ensure your product and we you can simply you can like us on facebook you can contact us that way there's always someone uh, managing our social media channel so feel free just to just to uh, direct message us and we'll, we'll certainly answer any questions you have when you send a message, sometimes you even get someone that shows up on your live stream and has a conversation about insurance and collectibles. Uh, Bob, I want to thank you, Bob, for taking the time out. Um, this has been a very informative and helpful conversation for me personally and based upon what I'm seeing here in the live stream. For the people that are watching this thing live, I really do appreciate you taking time out to actually join us because I think this goes a long way to helping people to understand what options might be available to them. So I want to say thank you for that. And uh, hopefully you had fun as well. And, and certainly I want to thank everyone that is in the chat. You guys are awesome. I want to thank you for uh, for joining and asking such wonderful questions. When this thing gets posted up again, if you guys have some additional questions, you can always post them there. My hope is that Bob and his team will have an opportunity to swing by and at least read some of those, if not respond to your questions that you have there. But again, reaching out to them directly is probably going to be your best route. All right, Bob, thank you, brother. I absolutely appreciate it. And everyone else, have a great night. Thank you, Reggie.